Good evening from New York. I am Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Journeys. The lovely lady next to me is a friend of mine, Gia Moron. Yesterday I was reminded I have to roll the R's. So tonight I'm going to roll the R's and I'm going to see Moron. Am I correct? That is correct. <laughs> Gia, finally. Finally. But before, before we get into this okay. conversation, let me just give a, little, a snippet of Gia. All right? It has to be a snippet because Gia has done so much. She launched her forum in 2012 and has worked with various small to mid-sized businesses, nonprofit organizations, entrepreneurs, speakers, and authors. It is no surprise Gia's client base covers many industries, as during her tenure at her former employee, the Goldman, the Goldman Group, Inc., where she has... Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs, right? Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. Where she has a media relations officer for... She was a media relations officer for 15 years. She oversaw many business lines. Our areas of focus range from urban investment, private equity, investment research and technology, to the forum's organizational focus in diversity, recruiting, corporate engagement, human resources and public services. And when I tell you this is really just a snippet, believe you me. So you know we are looking at a multifaceted woman. And why, why I say that? What I like to do on this show and only because I believe that each and every one of us is a gem with many facets. And oftentimes people get a glimpse of us and they only get to glimpse one facet and they form an opinion. What I like to do during the conversation, through my questions, is to twist the gem a little bit and expose the other facets. So you get a more multi-dimensional perspective of this person. <laughs> I, I promise you're you life, right? to be. Your life, right? uh, yeah, you, I know I'm not. You're not gonna have me cracking up tonight. You know, Absolutely, I, I am. Because you're not. I look. I watch your show. Okay. I see you. You know, send people into tears. I don't have waterproof mascara on no, tonight, so that's not happening. So if I promise to make you laugh, you must promise not to make me tear. I will not make you cry. Yeah, okay. I promise. <laughs> I promise that. So, um. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. So when those closest to you describe you? What are some of the things you agree with when they describe you? Hmm. Determined. Mm -hmm. Focused. I think. You know, honestly, I really don't know how they, they probably say I'm crazy most times because I, it, you know, depends on your definition of crazy, but I wouldn't argue if someone said that. Uh -huh. What do you say about yourself sometimes? Misunderstood, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe not misunderstood like I'm in uh, some category by myself, but I think it, it, the impression people get is, it probably varies from person to person, just depends on, I, I think I mesh with personalities, so right. I kind of click with who that person is and vibe with them. So you, you talk about misunderstood, what are most people you believe? are surprised to learn about you when they get to know you? <laughs> uh, I really believe I can do anything. <laughs> I <laughs> promise you. I, I do. I believe that I can do anything. I will look at something and decide that I can do Like this right here. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm about to set up a, a studio in my house. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. I just, I just believe that so much is um, possible mm -hmm. and attainable, um, which is why I don't easily get um, starstruck or awestruck, mm -hmm. um, because I admire people, but I'm not easily impressed, because mm -hmm. I believe that what the next... Everyone... Hmm, I'm going to use my words wisely. I believe that, that there's so much that's available to all of us, I believe that we put such limits on ourselves. So that's why I say I believe I can do anything. I want to get an idea. I want to get a glimpse of when this might have started. So, first of all, where were you born, dear? Brooklyn. Brooklyn I'm in a the house. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Woo, yeah, <laughs> Brooklyn house, yes. So born and raised in Brooklyn. Take us back. Uh -huh. Give us a glimpse of a nine year old year and a 15 year old year. Mm -hmm. I am so glad my mother didn't come with me. <laughs> I almost 
brought my mother with me. Um, okay, nine-year-old Gia. Nine-year-old Gia and 15-year-old Gia have always been tough. Mm. Always. Um, it's just how my father um, raised me. He, I think he wanted a boy, so he just treated me really, really tough. Um, so, um, yeah, nine-year-old Gia and 15-year-old Gia. Both tough, but I'd like to say nice. I think I'm nice. I try to be. Yeah. Well, what, what do you remember in particular? Let's let's go to let's go to the fifteen year old year. Okay. What, what do you remember in particular about the people you played with, the, the friends you had? What is one thing that sticks out from that particular time? Well, I was somewhat of a rebellious teenager, but even. In that space, um, I don't think I judged people. That was the one thing. I just kind of considered, even if I didn't know your name, and I do this to this day, you're my friend. I've called people my friends. Um, so, I, you know, if not anything, I just take people and accept them for who they are. Your dad perhaps wanted a boy, so you said. <laughs> so he treated himself. And, and, you know, growing up in an era, growing up in that time in, in the neighborhood, perhaps you needed to be tough, but um, I'm sure it has served you well today. Oh yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. So what, what do you remember about your parents that um, helped to shape this amazing person you have come to know as to your mom? What do I know about my parents? Um, Is there any special words of wisdom that either of them use that you remember to this day? It's interesting. I'm an only child. Oh. All right, so I have no siblings. Okay. Uh, but I've acquired siblings along the way, meaning through friends. Uh, but the one thing I think my both of my parents taught me was independence from a very, very young age. Um, so, you know, I think that's something that I still carry to this day. Um, I don't necessarily like being, you know, a wolf pack of one, but I don't have a problem being a wolf pack of one. Um, so I think that might be something. Yes, yes, I got it. If, if, if you were to walk in a room or stand outside of a room and overhear your parents telling a stranger about you, how do you think each of them would describe you? <laughs> Let's start with mom. I think both of them would say that I speak my mind. And that, that's been since I was a kid. I mean, I used to get spankings for speaking my mind just way too much. But I think that it, um, once I became an adult, my dad passed away in 2008, but once I became an adult, my parents respected that. I think they realized that I was just that person that, um, I'm just going to say what I want to say. Mm -hmm. wow. wow. Good. And, um, so, the women in your family, I love to ask this question. Women in right? Yes. How would you say the women have helped to shape who you have become? Ooh. Um... Wow, that's a really good question. Okay, so the women in my family, absolutely, um, well, on my mom's side, definitely, no, nah, I say both sides of my family. Yeah, we, we, we're pretty domineering. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's no way around it. We, my, my, I watched my mother, I watched friends, whomever have you, um, kind of run the families. But not in, a, not in a men don't count kind of way. I think that there were just more women than men on my mom's side of the family. Um, and then my grandmothers were just really strong women. Like really strong. And I spent a lot of time with them as a kid. So, yeah, I think they were really just strong women. Grandmother on both, grandmothers on both sides. Yes, absolutely. So my mom's mother... Um, 
was from Puerto Rico, so I spent time in Puerto Rico, and then my dad's mom was in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands, so I spent time there. You're so Caribbean. I am, and my mom's father's from Curacao. So yes, I'm very Caribbean. Wow. Oh. See things you didn't know about me, so. <laughs> <laughs> I am Lauren. When did you realize you had this knack for empowering people? I don't think I realized it. You told me that. Other people told me that. Yeah. I don't think I get up and say I'm going to empower and inspire someone today. Mm. I think it goes back to, I'm going to do what I want to do, um, be nice to people, be kind to people, uh -huh. and um, if they take something or, or get something out of what I'm doing, cool. And if you want to do it with me, then let's ride. Mm -hmm. The reason why I ask you that is because you, you, you have this amazing business, um, public relations this one, and that helps to shape, help to, to shape people and shape their businesses and present them a certain way or help people to discover what is it within them that can help them to go to the next level. We have lots of conversations. So I want to know, what was the trigger that caused you to become an entrepreneur? I know you transitioned from corporate to entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. but was it a, a matter of necessity? Was it you recognizing that with all the skills and knowledge and experience you have, you could make a difference in people's lives. Uh, I would say this was this has been an interesting journey. So going into public relations was never my idea. That was by accident. And I remember so I'll take you back to sixteen year old Gia, since you asked me about fifteen year old Gia. Sixteen year old Gia heard uh, from someone in I grew up in Williamsburg. So uh, Someone said to me, I'm one, hanging out with friends or something like that, um, you know, you should go into public relations. And I'm 16. I don't know what public relations is. I was like, yeah, whatever. Uh, and it's odd how you can hear something one time and you think you've forgotten it, but it's filed in the back of your mind. And how I got into it was through the entertainment industry. So I actually have over 20 years of experience within public relations, um, but it started in the entertainment industry and in television, uh, uh, international production and distribution company. And I took interest in what the director of promotions and publicity was doing at the time. And I took so much interest in what she was doing that she started training me and teaching me about her role. And I was like a sales assistant, mm -hmm. uh, working with, uh, if I remember correctly, because this is like 90s, early 90s, I was in the Latin America, Japan, I forgot, something. It, it, so I was in like a, a group that um, sold um, television shows uh, to different regions overseas. and But my interest in it was helping those uh, companies promote the shows. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got into it. And so I stayed within television for a few years and then got laid off from there. Um, got booted because the son, the father, yeah, this is real. So because the, father, the son of the owner was interested in my job. That's really what it was. The son of the owner was interested in Yes, wow. yes. It was a private company, although within a corporate sector, a private company. Um, you know, he came back home and um, he decided he liked what I did. And, and I took it from, the, the role was turned over to me and then I took it from there and did a lot with it, learned a lot over the time. And then he came in and I got booted. By getting booted, um, I ended up some way, somehow on Wall Street, which was crazy, because I didn't know anything about Wall Street, like nothing. Like, I listened to 1010 10 Wins, and I was still trying to figure out who Dow Jones was, but every day Dow Jones had some numbers. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't know. And then I, but when I got to Goldman, and I realized that they were starting a media relations department, I was like, oh, I know how to do this. I know what they're doing. It's just a different industry, but same thing. Mm -hmm. So I only thought it was going to be there for like maybe a few months, six months. It turned into like 15 years. 
um, and I learned everything about financial services on the job. So I knew about the PR side, but I didn't know about financial services. So I learned about financial services there, reading everything that I came across. And um, how I ended up as an entrepreneur, well, I think it was within me. And I'd always said that I wanted to start my own business, uh, but complacency got the best of me. That's it's the truth. Fear and complacency got the best of me, so I wasn't willing to jump at the time. And yet again, um, I'm grateful that the son's, um, that the, the owner's son wanted my job because I wouldn't have left the television industry and ended up in Wall Street. I am grateful that although uh, I was covering uh, one of the areas I was covering covering at um, Goldman uh, were some of the layoffs that were happening. And um, I was I was one of the statistics. I mean, I was part of the, the numbers, part of the headcount reduction. And it wasn't personal, it just was what it was. And quite honestly, it was the best thing to happen. So the, so the disappointments have um, helped you or helped to push you along the way? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And honestly, when I was laid off from both jobs, neither time was I disappointed. Oh. I'm just like, whatever. All right, on to the next thing. Yes. So one door closed and another one opened. I was ready to go both places. Yeah. I just hadn't made the move. So someone, you know, I look at it as God pushed me. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh, I can fly. Yes. <laughs> so is that how G GVM was born? When you left Golden? Um, not, no. I, okay, so... Let me think. So when I was laid off, I wanted to take some time off. Uh, I, I'm a mom. Mm -hmm. My daughter's 22 now, but uh, at the time she was 17. But early on in my career, when I had her, uh, I had gone back to work when she was five weeks old. So I'd never been home as a mother. And so for me, getting... Um, Getting laid off was a blessing on multiple levels. It was an opportunity um, to spend time at home with her because working in financial services a lot of hours mm -hmm. and um, getting to know home and my daughter and life and trying to figure out what was next. So, so tell us a little bit about GVM. GVM. So GVM Communications, you did ask me that. I don't know if I answered that. So GVM Communications is a public relations brand development consulting firm. Uh, initially, when I launched the company, I said, oh, I'm just going to help some businesses and kind of do what I wanted to do. But what I didn't tell you is that I was getting a little burnt out from being within the, the public relations space, media relations space. Uh, after the financial crisis, um, I was completely burnt out because most people will talk about 2008. Uh, we were still feeling it and still dealing with a lot of the ramifications even in 2010. So to me, um, you know, hours hadn't changed, the, the stress levels were still the same. So. I wanted to do something different. I didn't know what it was. And so when I was laid off and then took some time off, I thought, oh, maybe I'll just consult and do the same thing. What I discovered not long into launching my business is I didn't like my business because I fell into the complacency. So, you know, I had to make myself change a bit. So I said, well, the direct connection with the media, I wanted to change a little bit. I wanted to work with companies about their messaging. I wanted to work with individuals about building their brand and how they see themselves and, and work out a whole strategy, uh, as well as create relationships and opportunities that could create bigger, better brand opportunities and public relations opportunities. So, that I'm really good at, and I love it, and I have a lot of fun doing that. I'll do the media stuff too, but I really like this other stuff. So, what what are some uh, earlier challenge, challenge or some challenges you had when you first started? 
the biggest mistake I made, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you, but I, I'm going about to turn off Facebook Live in a second. So if you guys want to tune in to Selwyn Show, Conversations with Selwyn, you have to go to the website. Um, but what... Um, I should have taken a, a business class. Like, I really should have taken an entrepreneurship. That was the biggest um, mistake. I mean, I just jumped right in, right? Because there I go again telling you I can do anything, right? But I was ill-prepared. Well, how, how, what was the first, what was the first part of that made you realize that um, you were ill-prepared? What was one thing? I knew my job, but I didn't know how to run a business. So the operations of, of, of a business I didn't know. I'm business-minded, and I can think of tons of ways to um, create business opportunities. But when it comes to the accounting part, the legal part, um, all that other detail, I, I was horrible at it. Are you really? Yeah. No. It's and and it really does take a special knack and and um, commitment. Also, um, I think I started out saying that, you know, I don't necessarily want to be a wolf pack of one, but I can be. Entrepreneurship, um, sh I, I don't like to use the word should. Gemma Diller taught me that, and I, I always remember that. I never use the word should, it's almost like a curse. It is, in my opinion, entrepreneurship, you have the option of going into it by yourself, but why do you want to? You find people to help you run your business. And I probably did that wrong in the beginning. Um, uh, but I, you and I talk about that, though. Because I'm like, why are you doing everything yourself? Yeah. But it happens. Sometimes, you know, things happen out of necessity. Absolutely. You know, circumstances and so on. But well, that's it's, what it's, it's, it's good what you're saying, though, that yeah. because for young people who are listening or people who are thinking about, you know, they, they have certain creative skills and thinking about getting into business for themselves, here you are, an experienced entrepreneur, saying that it's important to take a business class. Oh, my goodness. Uh, get program, um, just just really get into, um, get that, the proper foundation in place. That's what I feel like. You, it, it's so necessary to get the proper foundation in place. And, um, I, you know, I also get a business coach. That was something I was not familiar with until I became an entrepreneur. I'd come across them within the corporate sector, but they were more professional coaches, right, within your career. Uh, within entrepreneurship, there are many business coaches, and there are some that are in my head. Uh, there are some that I watch religiously on, um, you know, on social media, and there are others that I've actually taken classes and have, you know, signed up for one-on-one -on -one coaching or been within their programs. Mm -hmm. Those are important. They're, I mean, it makes a huge difference. And and I'm five years in being an entrepreneur, and I'm really only learning that now. Wow. What did you enjoy? What did you enjoy the most as an entrepreneur? I enjoyed learning that um, I was undisciplined. <laughs> I need to get disciplined, and and I mean that in a. Um, I mean, yeah. It, most people will say, "Oh, I love being my own boss, and I love doing this." Um, but for me, I um, it require. I, I learned more about myself becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, was I? Um, do I have discipline? Do I? I'm at loss for words because there's there's a specific word that I want to say. Willpower. Mm -hmm. Do I have the willpower to stick with this? That's the word. Mm. What do you think? Oh, I'm not going anywhere. I made a I made a promise to myself. Like scouts honor. I'm in this. I am because the thing is, I left someone else's corporate job, but I'm I'm incorporated. Like, like my, my business, business isn't in corporation, right. so I'm I'm still in corporate. It's just mine. It's just yours. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I, I want to ask this question: the difference between one who's a publicist and one who does public relations. 
What is the difference? Okay, so and I get that often. And now I oh, all right, so you guys, I'm sorry, but I have to go. Bye. Okay, so the difference. Publicity. People generally hire people generally hire a publicist um, for media opportunities. That's what they're looking for. They are looking to get press. Uh, and you will find that um, and, and there's even a difference with media relations, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think I shared that with you and I probably should have brought like the specific details. Um, so when people say I need a publicist, mm -hmm. for me, I'm, I want to say to them, and the first thing I say is what do you do? And what industry are you in? And what exactly do you want a publicist to do for you? Uh, and most will say, well, because I want to get press. Okay, what do you want to talk about? So a publicist will seek speaking and, and media uh, opportunities. Public relations, uh, well, that's a grander scale. Uh, and I'll get to that in one second. And then you've got media relations. That's just strictly with the press. That's just building those relationships with journalists, uh, which is what I did at Goldman. And... Um, so most people are looking for publicists, and then uh, events people may be looking for a public relations firm to do from soup to nuts. So, what types of uh, businesses you would say need a public relations um, for? What types of businesses? Mm -hmm. What types of business? Mm -hmm. thing. So, so this, this is what I believe and this is what I've learned uh, coming from the corporate setting uh, into entrepreneurship. I believe more established businesses are could put better use to public relations services. Uh, I believe that there are some entrepreneurs, but I mean like successful entrepreneurs, that not someone who is in year one, year two, and they're still putting their, their shop together. Um, I don't believe they need to hire a publicist. I believe that they can begin to do the work themselves, and I've actually taught that in, in workshops. Uh, and the reason being is there are many people who have had, it's a very tricky and interesting industry. There are people who either respect the world and, 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 and the role of public relations and publicity, and then there are others who feel like they don't need that individual at all and they can do it themselves. Um, and that's all well, great, and fine until perhaps um, you might say something uh, in an interview that you might need some damage control or some crisis management mm -hmm. and whereas someone who has um, the relationships with media or knows the has the know-how to know how to work with that and I've seen many people crash and burn I've seen incidents um, the, the riots that were um, happening in um, oh my gosh uh, St. Louis well, what am I thinking uh, Ferguson mm -hmm. Ferguson was a great example. When in, it's actually interesting because I've never really talked about this before, but I discussed it with some friends of mine. So when Ferguson jumped off, I have to say that I wanted to go and help some of the organizations because I thought that the publicity around it and how they were handling it was a hot mess. And you know, I'm like, you know, I understand that they what they needed was uh, some crisis communications happening. And eventually they got there, but in the beginning, because it's not like, you know, a protest or a riot or whatever planned, so they were kind of just scrambling. But you can see that that's not something they'd ever dealt with before. And so I don't even know why I'm bringing this up, but it was just something that I was watching on television that I thought, oh my goodness, like they need, you know, certain help and, and talking points and a strategy, and they didn't have one. Do you do you have any do's and don'ts, or uh, let me say, frame this another way, for the young person who's thinking about getting into public relations, do you have one or two or three rules or principles that you 
govern your approach to the industry rather? I think the can I change that for you? Sure. Because, and the reason why I'm saying that is I think this is what's key. I think people use the term publicist, but they're unclear of the industry in which they want to go in, right? So I think I said this earlier, when, when entrepreneurs and small businesses are looking for a publicist, they even they'll ask me or they'll say, oh, you're in PR. You're, I have someone for you. And I'm like, no, not, maybe you don't. Because I can tell you what I don't do. I don't do entertainment PR. Mm -hmm. I started out in that in that area, in that industry, but that's not something that I'm drawn to. Now, I know really, really great and really smart publicists within the entertainment um, industry. And even then, there's a breakdown, right? You've got the music. You've got movies and television. So, you know, I think the important part for people, and I get this often, is Think about the industry you want to go in first. I was I was blessed to, you know, half the time in the television world. So I attended conferences like NAPD and, um, oh God, it's so over 20 years ago that I might be, like, aging myself. But I, but I yeah, so I, I was able to attend those conferences and then go over to financial services. A place that I thought I'd only be there for a few months, and it was like 15 years. And I know that I really enjoy corporate PR versus entertainment PR. So, just before we go to the break, yes, sir. One question: cannabis. Ah! <laughs> did you see my button? Did you see my button? <laughs> I didn't notice your button. My button. It says "Women know." You lift it up so that they can see it. Can they see it? Women see know. It? it says women know. Oh, women know. Women know. And oh. I'll explain that to you. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, how, public relations to cannabis. How, how, how did this happen? Had that happened? Mm -hmm. You know when you asked me, what do I like? Being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Making my own decisions to make uh, changes and turns within my business. So uh, it was an area that I had been reading about, which I mentioned earlier, I do a lot of reading, a lot of research. Um, I think that's something people know about me. I am probably a research nerd. Mm -hmm. uh, and I started hearing about it back in 2012 and just kind of gathering the information, following, not quite sure what I wanted to do. I thought I needed to shut my business down in order to go into it. And uh, in doing some research for a client, uh, for a publication that I was exploring, I came across an article and I read about one of the founders of the organization, which I'm a part of, and uh, was within the cannabis industry. And I realized this was the same woman that I saw on the 2020 special on the growing industry within Colorado. And the more that I started doing research about it, the more I said, oh, I'm interested, but I don't want to touch the plant and I don't want to work in a dispensary, nor do I want to open a dispensary. Mm -hmm. And by joining the organization Women Grow, which is a national organization uh, uh, which cultivates women leaders in the cannabis industry. That's basically what, what they're doing, right? So they're not growers, but they're helping women grow their businesses. I started attending their chapter meetings, and that's when I learned there. Um, actually, one of the directors of the Drug Policy Alliance asked me, well, what do I do? And I said, I do public relations. And she's like, well, why don't you do that here? And it was like a kind of one of those simple lights that I was like, oh, duh, why didn't I think of that? Um, and I, the more that I started researching, the more I started learning, I realized how much it was needed. Uh, but how much, so much more was needed. So, yeah, so that's me. It says women know. So I now know and continue to know and learn. And so instead of shutting down GVM communications, I expanded GVM communications to um, cover the cannabis industry. All right, let's take a quick break.